This morning's reading is taken from 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 to 6, and then chapter 3, verses 1 to 10. This can be found on page 1225 of the Church Bibles. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. We know that we have come to know him if we obey his commands. The man who says, I know him, but does not do what he commands, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But if anyone obeys his word, God's love is truly made complete in him. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. It turns to chapter 3, verses 1 to 10. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us, does not know us, is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself, just as he is pure. Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. But you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins, and in him is no sin. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. He who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. He who does what is sinful is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. No one who is born of God will continue to sin, because God's seed remains in him. He cannot go on sinning because he has been born of God. This is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not a child of God, nor is anyone who does not love his brother. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Rob. Uh, morning, everyone. Let's bow our heads and uh, we'll pray. Father, we thank you very much indeed that the same Holy Spirit who inspired the writing of these words is present with us here this morning. And we long, Father, that his work in us and among us will be effective and will bring about change that will please you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, what standards do we expect of people in public life? The question has been asked recently... Is this Parliament the worst Parliament in history? And for good reason, because more MPs have been sanctioned by the Commons and or resigned their seats in disgrace in this Parliament than any other in history. And of course, this Parliament still has another 16 months to run. And I imagine we think that those with a position in public life should be setting a good example, that it's right we hold them to certain standards of behaviour and to face the consequences when they don't do that. Well, the Apostle John thinks the same about the church. Just glance back to that second paragraph we looked at in chapter 2. We know we have come to know him if we obey his commands. The one who says, I know him, but doesn't do what he commands is a liar. If anyone obeys his word, God's love is truly made complete in him. This is how we know we're in him. Whoever claims to live in him must walk, live as Jesus did. 
So John's point is really terribly simple. If we claim to be a Christian, then we must obey Jesus. And our behaviour must be increasingly Christ-like, as the Spirit of God brings the Word of God to life in us. Here then we come to John's second test of faith. The obedience test. But before we go any further, it's very important we remember that this is not a perfection test. Again, go back to the beginning of chapter 2. John is not naive. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defence. John knows any and every Christian believer will continue to sin throughout their Christian lives and that the death of Jesus cleanses from all sin. How then does John want us to be encouraged and sure that we are following Jesus and that eternal life is ours by this test? Let's turn then uh, to uh, turn over now to uh, end of chapter 2 and to chapter 3. First heading then, Jesus' return means Christians will not continue in sin. Followers of Jesus are called on to live their lives in the light of the future. Verse 28, and now dear children, continue in him so that when he appears, we may be confident and unashamed before him at his coming. The future we look forward to is the return of Jesus. If the universe had a calendar, there would be one event in that calendar, and it would be Jesus' return. But no date is given for the universe or us to know. Now, the word John uses here about Jesus appearing refers, would have been referred to at the time in the sense of the coming presence of a king or an emperor. And notice that when King Jesus appears, some are going to welcome him with joy, others with shame. When he appears, we may be confident and unashamed before him at his coming. Shrinking back in shame is, is what that actually means. And the joyful ones are those who are also amazed. Look at 3.1. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. Great to hear Susanna talking about that a little earlier, wasn't it? None of us deserve the love which God has poured about on us. We are to be overwhelmed that the creator of the universe should love us, should love me, and should have made us children of God. And initially John says that uh, the reason the world does not know us is that it didn't know him. And you may have had that experience. Maybe you've got friends or family, you just can't get it that you're a Christian. They can't understand how someone like you could believe all this stuff about Jesus. It makes no sense to them at all. Uh, next slide, uh, desk, please. And as we look to that future, in verse 2, John says, even he doesn't know everything about that future yet. But what he does know is critical. But we know that when Jesus appears, we shall all be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Everyone has this hope in him, purifies himself just as he himself is pure. Jesus will appear, we shall be changed into his likeness because we see him as he is. So our future security lies with this Jesus. In chapter 2, John has already said the world and its desires is passing away permanence, permanent security belongs to our God. And that is a gift he gives us as his children. So if you're here this morning as someone who doesn't yet follow the Lord Jesus, you might like to give some thought to this. Give some thought to what is your life truly about? Is it a shadow of what it could be? 
all your hopes, all your ambitions, all your achievements will come to nothing, mere dust and ashes. What a waste. But for the one who trusts in Jesus, there is a great and glorious future, a great and glorious future that means change today. And we've got to live in the light of that future. Now, this is a a commonplace in life, isn't it? Uh, We're in the midst of uh, exam results season at the moment, aren't we? We've had uh, A-levels, GCSEs and some other things. GCSEs are next. Students prepared for those exams. Those exams have controlled what they've done over the last two or three years. If you've got an upcoming job interview, you've prepared for it. The great sport that's being played around the world at the moment and is about to be played. Demanded training, preparation, hard work and sacrifice. True of the Lionesses, true of those that were athletics championships, true of those hoping to go to the Rugby World Cup. That's how we live our lives. So verse 3 is the change that's demanded of us. Everyone who has this hope in Jesus purifies himself just as he, just as Jesus is pure. As somebody said, if heaven is the destination, we must be travelling the road that leads us there. And we look forward to being pure like Jesus, and so we begin to develop those habits now. Uh, The word purify means to remove moral stain. And I'm sure like me, you've got things in your past that you are ashamed of. Things that can still make you shudder when you remember them. But as a follower of Jesus, we know we have been forgiven. And our repentance says, I'm turning away from that way of behaving and that way of of living. I never want to go back there again. And you're not doing it to earn your status as a child of God. No, God's given you that out of his love. That's why and how you're a child of God. And we look forward to and we prepare for the appearing of Jesus by choosing to be more like him. Uh, Secondly then, Christians do not continue in sin Christians cannot continue to sin. That's the clear and straightforward message of verses 4 to 10. The next uh, two paragraphs tell us of the gravity of sin, why Jesus came into the world, and what that means for the lifestyle of each and every Christian. Have a look at verse 4 then. Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. But you know that he appeared so he might take away our sins, and in him is no sin. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. Verse 9. No one who is born of God will continue in sin because God's seed remains in him. No one can go, cannot go on sinning because he has been born of God. Now, the... Uh, The point here is that this is a continuous and present way of life. That's the uh, Greek tense that uh, John uses here. This is about persistent behaviour. This is about a lifestyle. It's been said that the believer will fall into sin, but will not walk in it. It's a bit like when I was at school. And the key issues for pupils at that time were, how long was your hair and how wide were your flares? I think flares are great. I'm so glad to see them coming back. They're terrific. (laughs) And from the platform at school, we were told, pupils at Kingston Grammar School will not, do not, wear their hair over their collar. Pupils at Kingston Grammar School do not wear their flares beyond a certain measurement. I can't remember what the measurement was. Was that true? Did pupils at Kingston Grammar School not wear their hair over their collars? 
what we worked out was that you could tuck your hair inside your collar and pull your collar over. So that looked fine, didn't it? And who was going to measure your flares anyway? You could tuck them into your socks if needs be. So that was all right. This is the same sense then. Christians do not, cannot continue to sin. But of course, we will. But we know that forgiveness is always there. But we can always come back to the cross and turn away from that wrongdoing. Forgiveness and our commitment to a changed life remains. Let's look at the first paragraph in a bit more detail then. We can't continue in sin because Jesus came to take away sins. That's verses 4 to 7. Continuing in sin is incompatible with being a Christian. John tells us the gravity of sin. Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. And that's what Satan tempted Eve and Adam with in the garden. He told them they could ignore the word God had spoken because it wasn't what he'd really said anyway, because the consequences were not what he said they would be, and because he really just wanted to spoil their fun. And today, we find that people make the words the Bible say the opposite of what they do say. We're told that there will be no comeback for our disobedience, and we're told much better to live free of such shackles and bounds in order to be true to the people that we are. If that is true, why on earth did Jesus come into the world? Why did he die on the cross? Look at verse 5. Uh, next slide, please, guys. But you know that when he appeared, so the, you know, that he appeared so that he might take away our sins. Jesus hung on the cross bearing our punishment. And he took our sins by bearing that penalty. In the light of that... How can you keep on sinning? How can you keep in a persistent lifestyle of disobedience? Well, you can't if you know him, if you understand what he has done for you. If you've relatively recently become a Christian, I want you to consider the differences in your way of life now from before you trusted in Jesus. Do you have a different attitude towards doing wrong? Well, if the answer to those questions is yes, then be encouraged. That shows you're a true believer. If you've been a Christian for a length of time, are you more aware of sin than you ever were before? Do you keep coming back to the cross for forgiveness? Are you as determined, more determined to resist temptation as you ever were? Do you hate sin? Like the Apostle Paul who said, what a wretched man I am, who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death. If so, be encouraged. You are a true believer. Jesus was without sin. Jesus' mission was to take away our sins. Living in him, we cannot continue in sin. Sin and the Christian are incompatible. And then verses 8 to 10. Because Jesus came to destroy the devil's work. Continuing sin is incompatible with being a Christian. Look at verse 8. The origin of sin. He who does what is sinful is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. Therefore, no one who is born of God will continue in sin. Jesus came to destroy the devil's work. So you see, the believer may fall into sin, but won't walk in it. The Christian hasn't just seen God, the Christian has been born of God, verse 9. And God's seed, the Spirit, is given to us. God's seed remains in him. 
Therefore, living a life of sin is now impossible. So, to which family do you belong? God's family or the devil's family? That is the question John poses for us. Verse 10, this is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Once again, we're getting used to this, I guess, John's language is very stark, isn't it? He's not offering us a middle way. You are either of the devil's family following the father who sinned, or you are of Jesus' family following the one who was without sin. Uh, When I was uh, getting the paper this morning, I noticed on uh, a headline on one of the other papers, something along the lines of, the devil walks among us or the devil is among us today. And it was an article about Lucy Letby, the uh, nurse who had killed those children. So you see, our world is quite happy to use the language of following the devil, doing the devil's work, when it applies to something as terrible as that. But John is saying all those who continue to live in sin, all those who will not repent and turn away from their sin and turn to Jesus, are actually of the devil's family. You don't need to be operating at that level. Any sin is following the devil. So therefore, we must ask ourselves in all seriousness, am I persisting in sin? Am I knowingly carrying on a behaviour which the Bible clearly says is wrong? If that is true, you may well prove to be of the devil's family. To show you're not, you need to come back to God in repentance, seek forgiveness, and turn away from those things. Maybe it's a sexual relationship. Maybe it's gossip, theft, or greed. You must leave it behind. Because as Christians, we're not free to follow the world's way. We're not free to follow the devil's way. He and they are not to control our lives as individuals or as a community here. Maybe you feel the discomfort of living in the world, then I think that's a good thing. Sometimes you may be uncomfortable around family and friends who aren't believers in Jesus. Again, I think that's a good thing. I can think of a friend who every year went away with a bunch of non-Christian girlfriends. She said when she got home, she felt as though she needed a shower because of the language and the attitudes that she'd been submersed in for that weekend. Let's be clear. John is not asking for perfection. He wants us to grasp the seriousness of the situation and to live in the light of it. That is, to show our love for Jesus by obeying his commands. Not perfection, but progress, as the Spirit does his transforming work in us. And we should be hugely encouraged as we see that progress in one another as well as in ourselves. Real assurance that I'm with Jesus and looking forward to eternal life. Jesus' mission when he came into this world was to destroy the works of the devil. Having been born a child of God, I will not continue in sin because sin and the Christian are incompatible. John says... See how different you are. See all that God has done for you and live in the light of it. Jesus will return. Jesus' mission was to take away sins. 
Jesus' mission was to destroy the works of the devil. So be encouraged. Hate your sin. Turn from it. Love Jesus. Love his word. Seek to live by it with the help of the Spirit. Such are the signs of a true believer. Because of Jesus, Christians are called to live change lives. And because of Jesus and his gift of the Spirit to us, we can indeed be those changed people to his glory. Let's bow our heads and we'll pray.